time. Um, uh, my name is Adam Kluss. I'm the Planning and Development Administrator, and I'll be um, starting kicking off the meeting for us here tonight. And like I said, we'll just give it here a couple more minutes to allow the folks last minute to get in here, and we'll get started right on time. Things I'm awesome. I have no idea actually. I think it's recording. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, it was about it. this time I'm, for the commission meeting. It was, oh, why are you? Why are you at? <laughs> and no idea. <laughs> then the flops went. <laughs> Those folks that have joined so far, if uh, we could ask you to please mute your mic. Yep, so can I. And I'm, I'm watching the uh, chat functions you have. So. <clears throat> When I share it, you'll be able to see it. All right, we're at 6.30. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Colossa. I'm the Planning and Development Administrator for the Parks Division, and this presentation is designed to provide the public information in regard to the spillway replacement project at Mina Lake. A couple of housekeeping items. We ask that everyone please keep your microphones on mute, and um, please do so at this time if you haven't already done that. We ask also all questions be sent through the Zoom chat function in order for GFNP staff to take the opportunity to address them as time allows after the presentation. It is my understanding there's a large contingent of folks gathered at the Wakeside Bar and Grill, and we would like to ask a single point of contact from that group to enter questions on behalf of the folks that are at Wakeside Bar and Grill. Secondly, the department will be recording the meeting to upload onto the state Game Fish and Parks website for those unable to attend this evening. Contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation for follow-up questions. I would like to thank all of our participating staff, Mr. George Kessler and Ms. Julie Johnson for their efforts with coordinating and accommodating Minor Lake residents. Mr. Kessler has provided me a comprehensive list of questions that GFMP staff intend to address during the presentation. A project of this scale has taken several months of planning. It is the department's mission to provide sustainable outdoor recreational opportunities to the public and to complete this project, continued communication and coordination will be necessary. The department has come up with a design and construction outline that balances project costs along with potential impacts to Minor Lake residents and outdoor enthusiasts. The project will provide some temporary inconveniences. However, the result will be a professionally engineered new spillway structure to provide sustainable outdoor recreational opportunities for years to come. Before the start of the presentation and to start off on a good, loop, good note, I'd like to address a few rumors that have passed uh, through the department from Lake Association members. 
Um, first of all, construction of the spillway will not start until after the 4th of July holiday weekend. That is something that we feel um, is a good compromise with allowing the contractor um, an appropriate amount of time to get the construction done, but also accommodate uh, those folks that are uh, residents of that area. Secondly, the project is nearing the end of design phase, but has not been advertised for bids yet. Um, we have heard rumors that some folks um, believe that the project has been advertised and that is not true. We are not to that point yet. And we will be in communication with the uh, Mile Lake residents and the public when that does happen. And uh, third, funding is already in place for the department. The Mino Lake residents will not be assessed any, any kind of fees or, or will not be asked to contribute to this project as um, we are taking advantage of a, a loan program through the state of South Dakota to help fund this project. That being said, we will address these in more detail in our presentation. At this time, I'd like to ask Chris to um, start the presentation, please. Okay, first a little bit of the history of the spillway. Um, back in the early 1930s, there was um, several dams built in the state of South Dakota, Mina Lake, of, uh, which is one of them. And in 1945, the concrete spillway was modified and the stilling basin was extended. In 2019, we experienced a localized uh, large rainfall event that caused some damage to the existing spillway. And immediately following that, um, we hired a consultant engineer to get on board to provide us with both a short-term repair and a long-term fix that um, brings us to where we are today. In 2020, the temporary repairs were made to the spillway, again, which were, which were temporary in nature, um, just to buy us some time in order for the consultant engineer to go through the process of designing a complete spillway replacement. In 2020 through 2021 is when the consultant engineer has been uh, working on these plans and GF&P staff have been working with the consultant engineer and coming up with the design that we are proposing today. Um, construction is planned on starting this summer through next spring. Next slide, please. Uh, these are a couple of pictures taken um, after the 2019 event that um, depict the damage that was done on the spillway. Next slide, please. Next slide. And, and the, the, the cost for the temporary repairs that were done in 2020 were approximately 350,000. Next slide, please. Um, with that starting information, I'd like to hand it over to our engineering staff here at the in Pier um, to go over some of the details of the spillway. Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is James Gilkerson. I'm an engineer here for the Game Fish and Parks. I've been working in conjunction with Bar Engineering out of Minnesota. They've been hired to do to de design the plans and specs for this project. Uh, currently we've got the 30% design plans and that's what we're using to make this presentation today. Uh, so to kind of get into the spillway information right off the bat here, um, Mine Lake is currently a Category 2 or, or a significant, significant hazard dam. Um, it is classified this way due to the potential damage to railroad and highway bridges just downstream of the dam there. Um, this classification determines requirements such as capacity and infrastructure. Um, get into it a little bit later on in the, in the presentation here, but we're required to have a low level outlet uh, for future maintenance um, of the dam. Um, the current existing elevation of the crest, uh, spillway, the spillway crest is 1413.64, and we are gonna have the same spillway elevation with the new spillway. Um, so we'll have see the same original high water mark and average uh, water levels in the lake that we currently see. Um, the existing spillway is approximately 11,000 CFS and with the new spillway, we're looking at approximately 13,000 CFS, which is about a 2,000 CFS increase. Um, 
due to some hydraulic changes, but we're gonna widen out the spillway a little bit and change some of the hydraulic properties. Um, in the lower right hand corner there on the slide, you can see this kind of the correlation um, of the, the flood events with their compared flow, uh, just for a little reference there. Um, moving on to the spillway dimensions. Somebody writing on a screen. <laughs> All right, so like I discussed earlier, uh, the crest elevation is going to remain the same. Um, the crest length, uh, which is the width of the spillway, if you're upstream or downstream looking up. Um, the existing spillway is 148 and a half feet and then next down to 132 foot at the downstream section. Our new spillway is going to be approximately 150 foot wide and maintain that width throughout the entire spillway. Uh, the spillway length um, existing is 170 foot and we're going to be shortening that by 24 foot to 146 foot. Um, we're going to take a little bit out of the steel basin downstream as well as remove the concrete apron on the upstream side. Uh, removing this apron uh, increases the efficiency of the dam uh, due to some of those hydraulic properties. Um, and the figures below you can see uh, the existing spillway, how it bottlenecks, and then the, on the right we've got our proposed spillway. Um, and you can see the alignments there on the north side and south side of the proposed structure are our low level outlet alignments and we're currently leaning towards option b which is on the south side of the spillway and that's to approximately lower the lake by three to three and a half feet to allow for that future maintenance um, whether it be riprap or concrete repairs in the future uh, moving on to the cross-section view of the spillway and still basin uh, this is the proposed um, proposed structure here. Uh, moving left to right, you can see we got a seepage cutoff wall. Um, right now that bar is working on ironing out the dimensions and getting further details of what we're going to require with that seepage cutoff wall. Uh, this figure just shows that we will have one to cut off the seepage and prevent um, water movement beneath the dam. Um, you can see on the gray lines or on the outside, we've got our concrete wing walls as well as footings, uh, concrete footings there. And we also show our under drain system to keep water from underneath the spillway and get it flown over the top where it should be. On um, the downstream section there, you can see some thrust blocks and uh, energy dissipators to help slow that water down and prevent any erosion in the tailwater where we also have um, riprap downstream as well. Moving on to the project work area. This is a preliminary aerial just showing kind of the, the construction limits um, in relation to uh, Nesbitt Drive across the embankment of the dam, as well as the spillway structure itself um, and north into our archery range and boat ramp area there. And this next slide is just a further detailed aerial with our um, proposed construction limits, as well as uh, just some topo survey with the existing structure there. And the next slide, getting into the construction work area. Um, on the north side, um, of the figure on the right, you can see a shaded area. That's our temporary diversion channel. That's going to be installed in conjunction with a coffer dam system to prevent any high flow rain events um, from washing out our construction area. It's going to divert any water to the north up and around to the downstream area of the construction so we don't lose any progress and, and keep water out of our construction area there. Um, we do anticipate some short-term road closure of Nesbitt Drive. Um, we don't know for how long or when in the um, project at this time. Uh, like Adam said, we don't have a contractor in place right now or a final set of plans. We will know more further in the, in the progress of this project and we'll keep everybody up to date 
um, on any potential road closures. We just do anticipate some for a short term amount of time. Um, and that road closure could be due to the siphoning system, what we'll use to uh, lower the lake. And ultimately that will be uh, determined by the contractor as well. They'll submit a water um, disposal plan to the GFP in conjunction with DNR um, for lowering the lake. Um, but we do anticipate them using a siphon system across the road and that could hinder traffic or have to change um, road closures with that. Um, the closure of the archery range, as you can see, our, our diversion channel uh, will be in the archery range area. And so the archery range will be closed for the duration of construction um, due to that diversion channel. It'll also be used as a staging area uh, for construction. The south side of the spillway will also be used as a staging area uh, during construction for materials and or equipment. Um, our low level outlet, like I kind of touched on before, we're leaning towards that south alignment going underneath the bridge on the south side of the spillway um, and kicking out into the still and basin. That'll be used in the future uh, to lower the lake about three to three and a half feet uh, for future maintenance. And then as we all know, there's vegetation between the bridge and the spillway in the form of cattails. We will be removing that, those uh, during construction. And then in the future with our low level outlet, we'll use that low level outlet to lower the lake to remove the cattails, whether it be by mechanical or um, spray to get those out of there and keep that area clean. <clears throat> Moving on. And this is just a, a more in-depth, closer image of what we just talked about with the diversion channel across the archery range, our low level outlet, um, staging area on the south side, um, approximate area for the siphon system and construction limits. Next, we'll just kind of summon up the, the project impacts with the spillway replacement. Um, there could be the potential of the boat ramp um, just to the west of the, the bridge there and that fishing pier being closed um, due to either low water levels or um, contractor construction equipment or being required for a staging area. Um, and then our temporary diversion channel, uh, like I said before, that will close down the archery range uh, for the duration of construction. And then the reservoir drawdown with that siphon system, um, given the, the contractor uh, an upper and lower limit, and that upper limit being approximately a 10 foot maximum lake drawdown level. Um, but we will know more when we get a contractor in place um, and have a better idea of their capabilities um, in drawing the lake down and getting the work done. Um, and like I said before, those short term road, road closures, um, we'll know more uh, further on in the, in the project here. Um, and we'll do our best to keep everybody up to date and everybody with pertinent information. We're going to take just a short pause for uh, we jump in here and try to get that uh, Somebody, on my screen. Get rid of the drawings we have on the screen. Somebody, uh, it came from a remote somewhere. Now I'm trying to figure out how to do it. There we go. Okay. Well, this might be a good opportunity for those folks. If you have any questions up to this point, uh, feel free to use the chat function again to uh, write in any questions. We hope to address uh, a few others here with the with the remaining slides in the presentation and uh, follow up at the end on um, answering some of the questions that uh, maybe didn't get answered during the presentation and then we'll take a short period of time at the at the end to uh, address those questions that were submitted through the chat function. With that we're going to hand it off to our um, wildlife and fisheries specialty person here, Jason Jung Jason Jungworth. Yep, Jason Youngworth here, Aquatic Habitat and Access Coordinator for the department. Just gonna go through a few 
slides that kind of talk about uh, uh, water usage and what you can do for with your properties and stuff during this time of drawdown. One thing is you heard, we're going to have to draw the lake down to, for the contractor to be efficient and safely uh, repair the spillway. With that, we're going to have some potentially limited to no use times during construction. We're not going to exactly know what those are until we have that contractor on hand, but uh, we'll know more once we know the drawdown limits. But for reference here, for the boat ramps being usable, as was mentioned, the spillway crest elevation is 141364. The bolt ramp is still usable till 1409.5 with the bottom planks at 1407. So it, that, boat, that bolt ramp is going to become unusable with about a four foot drop in elevation. Um, there's just not much we can do. It's, it's just the lesser of two evils we have. And, you know, as been alluded to, that's one of the reasons why we're waiting to start work till after the July 4th holiday. Um, we'll have some better updated information we'll, we'll provide with some uh, lake contour maps on how this will affect each property and around the lake once the springtime where our lake maps, our current lake contour maps are outdated and not digitally imported into our systems. We're going to be have staff out and try to collect that data as soon as ice off comes so we can um, model what these drawdowns, different drawdown periods will do and provide that information when that time comes. One other thing we're going to do with these ramps, we're going to take the opportunity, we're going to look at our plank or boat ramps out there and do any necessary repairs at that time. We're going to have a perfect opportunity we, that we don't usually see these ramps, the bottom planks, because they're underwater. So we may end up closing, closing them for a time being just to make, make needed repairs and make sure they're up and running for a lot longer time frame. The campground will remain open at all times from here moving forward, no matter what the lake level draws. This might be, might have some limited recreational use opportunities. Next slide. Some of the questions have come in about potential wildlife and fish impacts moving forward. Right now, we're not anticipating any fisheries or wildlife uh, negative impacts to either population. That's why we've looked at and assessed the, the current water depths in the lake, you know, the bottom maximum depth of the 26 to 27 feet and a lot of 20, 22 foot around the lake. If we are feel comfortable, if we don't exceed that 10 foot drawdown, we should be able to maintain this fishery through this uh, construction period, including into the winter time. Because um, right now, you can anticipate the lake will not refill until springtime. Um, we just don't typically get enough uh, snow and rain for the lake to fill in the fall when, when most of the construction is going to take place. And their window of construction is, is up until March. So when they, and we have that, that amount of time. So we just don't know when the lake will fill. A lot's going to be dependent on the rain and snow. It's just something we can't, we can't do and we can't import water into there. Just going to have to leave it at the mercy of Mother Nature for this project. Next slide. Brings into, there's some, a lot of questions that have come in about shoreline work. This is an opportunity for any lake property owners to do shoreline work. But order any work that you do, you need to, it needs to be permitted through Game Fish and Parks. And we have a shoreline and bottomlands modification application permit. And your point of contact for that is listed here. Rhett Russell, our fisheries biologist for Habitat and Access based out of Watertown. Um, he's going to be your point of contact. Anything you want to do, make contact. Jot this information down now, and it'll, it'll be coming up with a point of contact uh, later on. So anything you want to do, any questions, make sure you contact him running through. And what we mean by shoreline work is if you haven't done any improvements to your lakefront outside of the water, uh, so any new construction, or if you need to make any modifications to any con existing construction, you know, it'd be a good time, but they all have to be permitted through that, that application process. Also, if you plan on doing any dredging, you need to be realistic, use the same app, uh, application permit, have a solid plan in place because all material needs to be hauled off-site and off-site means a location where that material cannot be re-entered into the waterway. So if you're going to put it in that watershed somewhere and it's on the, on the edges of a, a stream or tributary or anything like that where any rain event or water event can bring it back in, that's not going to be acceptable. So. Uh, 
just make sure when you start looking at these things, probably start making plans now. Uh, reach out, contact Rhett, and he'll help guide you in the right direction. Nothing is going to be allowed when you talk about dredging that's going to affect water quality. So essentially anything that's in the water, it's not going to probably be allowed without a, a lot of extra permitting and a, and a proper plan. Dock extensions. You know, we're, this is going to be a, a big question too. There's going to be potentially some uh, mud flats between your shoreline and where your dock is. Uh, your normal dock can be used and we have, but you can't add anything to that dock. If you got a dock extension that's going to extend over the water longer than 60 feet, you're going to need a boat dock variance from your local conservation officer. And along with that, you're going to need to have a liability waiver signed as well. Now that being said, if you want to leave and use your existing dock, you can do a temporary walkways out there, but all that material that you use has to be removed upon oh, the lake my. filling up. So moving forward, ideas of that would be use like pallets or boards, not bricks, not gravel or anything like that. So things that you can easily remove to use your existing ramp uh, or boat dock. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, at this at this time, this is Adam Kalesa again, the Planning and Development Administrator. I'm going to go through the um, uh, questions about funding. Uh, this this entire project, uh, we estimate the cost at approximately 3.8 million dollars, which does include the temporary um, repair fix that was done in 2020. Um, when this uh, when the damage first happened in 2019, uh, this, the uh, county up there was eligible in the eyes of FEMA for a, dec a disaster declaration, and we went through the process through GFNP here to work with FEMA. And ultimately, FEMA found this project ineligible um, for, for various reasons, and we're still looking into that as a department. But we anticipate that because of the age of the, of the structure, that um, uh, FEMA is going to end up uh, denying any claims based on the age of the, of the, of the structure. Um, this project will be funded by Game Fish and Parks, utilizing a disaster loan program that's administered through the Department of Public Safety. Um, the Department of Public Safety um, opened up this loan pro program for both state entities and local governmental agencies that, that were in the uh, declaration disaster areas. And so, um, um, so we didn't have to take as big of a hit on our budget. We are planning on using this loan program to fund this project and um, ultimately we will end up having to pay that back over time. But to be able to do uh, this dam project along with uh, other damage that we incurred through the 2019 um, flooding disasters, um, this, is really, this has really been a lifeline for us to be able to use this program um, in order to continue to maintain other things that we've got going on across the state. There will be a continued effort to identify funding partners and funding assistance. Like I said, we're still going to be looking into um, um, uh, measures to try to get some FEMA funding, um, albeit pessimistic that that um, will come to fruition. Uh, we always, as a department, try to reach out to third party agencies, etc., to try to stretch our taxpayer dollars the best that we can. Uh, the minor lake taxpayers will not be responsible for any supplemental funding and GFMP will be managing all the contracts and payments made for the entire project. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to go through a contingent timeline based on um, you know, everything going smoothly here. Um, over the next month or two, we plan on continuing to work with our consultant engineer as well as the engineering staff here at GFMP and getting a complete set of plans that we can bid let out in that uh, April to May time frame. With that April to, to May time frame bid letting, um, we usually take a couple of uh, two to three weeks for the uh, for submission of uh, proposals for the uh, co for contractors. And then in that period of between May and June, we'll be selecting a contractor and working with that contractor to to create a con a construction schedule. And um, like has been mentioned before, we plan on. Uh, sharing with those folks at um, Mina Lake and the uh, the public around that area, uh, every detail that comes up when we um, start working with a selected contractor. 
Um, after the contractor is selected, we will have a um, you know we'll have a primary meeting and we'll be able to um, start creating that schedule. And as of right now, to not constrict our contractor, we are going to allow the contractor to start drawing down the lake right after Fourth of July weekend. Um, again. Until we have a contractor in place, we will not know if they start the first day after the 4th of July weekend, but we will be relaying those details as soon as possible. Um, again, th th this isn't an effort to not constrict the contractor. Um, the more we, we constrict the contractor with these kinds of things, um, the higher expectation we have to drive up costs. And we're trying to do the best that we can in, in taking the uh, taxpayers' money very seriously here and trying to get this project done um, at as low of a cost as possible, but also taking into consideration those folks around the lake. Um, spring 2022, uh, we expect the lake elevation to rise. Under normal winter and spring moisture conditions, we would expect that the lake would be um, would be filling up with that with uh, those type of conditions. Um, again, we are going to be at the mercy of Mother Nature. And um, we, we don't want to make any um, unexpected promises that the lake is going to be completely filled. But we do anticipate with the large watershed in this area that with, with, a, with a normal spring runoff and normal winter moisture, that the lake will um, again return to be a functioning uh, recreational lake again in 2022. And then the spring of 2022, as the contractor um, is substantially complete with the spillway construction, they will work their way out and cleaning up things, including the archery range, and we expect the archery range to be back open shortly in the, um, after, you know, during the spring of 2022. Um, at this time, I'd like to go through a few of the questions that I, I, I kind of knew that maybe wouldn't be addressed during the presentation that um, Mr. Kessler was, um, uh, be, was able to provide us. Uh, starting at the top, can we put culverts in to handle the overflow and build a wall around the spillway in order to avoid lake drawdown? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, again, we try to balance this project with um, you know, consideration in, uh, for funding and, and as well as the lake residents. And something of this nature would um, add um, an incredible amount of expense to the project and we would still have to have some kind of measures to be able to um, to be able to handle a, a large water event, and we'd still have to have some kind of diversion made, even if we did something like this. And so, um, that that option was never really considered. Um, we're using this diversion channel as our as our way to be able to handle a large rain event during the summer after the drawdown has been taken place. And again, we're going to leave that up to the contractor to. Uh, make the decision on what level they need to draw the lake down to in order to have enough capacity to handle a large rain event and to avoid um, delaying this project being um, being pushed down the road because of some large rain event that they can't get in there and do their work. Next question, will there be an option to put a temporary dike near the Wakeside Bridge? Very similar question. Uh, this question came in um, with reference to another project up in Aberdeen that has been done up at uh, Moxon Creek. And we're going to deliver kind of the same answer here, that the, the cost of doing this, um, again, is not something that um, uh, we feel is in the best interest of using the taxpayer dollars. And it's something that, um, again, we're now considering based on that fact and the fact of it also would need to um, have some kind of um, structure to allow you know overflows for a large rain event to be able to be to be passed by and we don't want to have the extra liability of creating something like that uh, that could potentially cause some flooding issues if we alter alter something like that with um, that kind of idea uh, next can the water from the ethanol plant be used to refill the lake after project completion um, like we mentioned before um, we anticipate with normal moisture that the lake will refill on its, no, on its own with Mother Nature. Um, it, is water from the ethanol plant a possibility? We haven't specifically looked into that um, because of the fact that we believe that we feel pretty confident that the lake will refill on its own. And again, the additional cost related to having some kind of uh, supplemental water source to help fill the lake is something that we feel is, is, is not the best use of the taxpayer dollars. 
Uh, next question, will there be a smell during construction? Um, I wish I could tell everyone that there's not going to be a smell, but um, I think uh, if folks have been around enough and, and experienced low water levels, maybe at this lake or other lakes, that um, yes, there, there probably will be some type of smell during construction. And for how long that is, um, hopefully um, we get into the, into the fall months and stuff starts to freeze up and, and hopefully the smell, if there is any smell, um, that will be taken care of in the fall. And, and hopefully when, uh, when everything is done and we're into next year that we've got a lot better, uh, we've got a lot better stuff going on because we've cleared out the cattails and folks have done some shoreline work and um, we, we anticipate that things will be much better after construction. Uh, the, the biggest question that I know most folks will have is how long will the lake actually be drawn, drawn down for? And I am, you know, the political answer is, is, you know, we're really going to leave it up to the contractor to tell us what they need to do to be effective in order to complete the project within the time frame that's given and within the budget that we, that we agree upon. Um, you know, we, we'd like to, to preface this with, um, you know, basically telling everyone that, you know, we can anticipate that if the contractor does decide that this lake needs to be drawn down past the level of the, of the bolt ramp functioning, that it will basically limit use to smaller, smaller um, boating type things that can be taken out manually by people from the shoreline, um, paddle boats and smaller boats and that kind of thing. And GFMP has no intention on building a temporary uh, structure, um, again, because of the relative cost um, to a temporary structure. And um, unfortunately, this is a small drawback from um, being able to um, allow the contractor to perform this work to the best of their abilities and so that we don't end up having to drag this project on any longer. We, we really want to try to narrow it down to have the least amount of effect on people. And we feel like this plan and design offers the best uh, combination of taking consideration uh, for those um, lake property owners, as well as allowing us to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and not constricting our, not constricting our contractor to a, to a timeline that um, ends up increasing cost. Will property owners be able to contribute to fish habitat improvements? Um, I would encourage anybody that wants to do anything like this or, or get together as an association and, and come up with money to, again, work with Rhett Russell, um, our, our fish and habitat person over there, contact in Watertown, and, and he'll be able to coordinate any of those efforts with you. At this time, I'd like to uh, ask Chris if there are um, any questions brought in from the chat function that we can address. Go ahead and read them off. Okay. Can the state park boat ramp be available without charge during the boat ramp closure? Um, I guess the first question I have, will it be open during the, and will it be usable for the majority of the time? No. I mean, it'll probably not be usable. My understanding is they have similar bottom elevations. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, the archery range, can it reopen after construction? Yes, I believe we answered that question that um, as the contractor is leaving the worksite area, that'll be one of the last things that gets taken <clears> care of is working their way out through the archery range and we'll get that open as soon as possible. Okay. What will control the water at the entrance to the low level outlet? There, the details of that are still getting worked out. Uh, I'm Ryan Tobin, the engineering supervisor here with Kingfish Parks. But again, we're working with bar engineering out of the cities there to work out the final details of that. But it'll essentially be a, a, a through pipe uh, through the embankment with a valve on it uh, to allow siphoning and, and water to evacuate the lake. Uh, is this a time where we can work collectively to remove trees that are falling in the water or that have already fallen in? This would be one that you would want to work with Rhett on, on that process. Uh, when the water is drawn down, will we consider it a bit of a no wake zone or limited boat use on the remaining water? I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Yes, we're going to, 
Um, we're, we're not going to impose any type of um, no wait zone areas unless the contractor sees fit that they need that um, um, type of, of, of boundary given to protect their work area. Um, but we, we fully anticipate that once the, once the lake drawdown starts mm -hmm. to happen, that if and when the boat ramp goes out of function, that we are going to be relying on the, on the lake residents to take personal responsibility of, um, of continuing to stay informed about the lake level um, so that we don't get caught with our pants down with somebody not being able to get their boat out of the lake. Um, and so um, my advice would be to um, tell everyone that um, let's plan on there not being boat ramp access and then um, if we can work with the contractor to um, not have the lake drawn down as far that's something that we can look into and and coordinate with the with the local folks but um, uh, I would like everyone to start kind of putting in their mind that um, it's very likely that the boat ramp will be out of function and there will um, essentially be um, at your own risk um, by by you know you know leaving your your boat um, on your on your boat lift etc um, again, you know, holding you know, holding the folks around there, you know, personally responsible for staying in tune with what's going on to make the right decisions for yourself. Okay. Would this be a good time to dredge the sandbars around the lake? Um, it would be a great opportunity to um, do some dredging. However, with the complexity and the uh, the cost of the current project, um, that is not something that we've considered um, dredging. We do a lot of dredging around the state of South Dakota, and it comes at a significant cost. And again, to try to keep the cost of this project down, we're going to really try to limit it to uh, making sure that we've got a, a, a really nice spillway structure that can um, that can last for decades to come and and provide a um, an excellent outdoor um, recreational opportunity for folks in that area. Will the contractor be allowed to pour concrete during freezing weather? If the contractor proposes uh, freezing weather concrete, we would expect uh, you know, common construction practices, i.e. housing and heating of that concrete to be used uh, and therefore no detrimental effects on the, the quality of that concrete. So uh, if they propose uh, winter cold weather concrete, uh, yes, we will consider it. Okay. Will the diversion channel handle a large rain event like the one experienced last year at Elm Lake? Uh, again, we're still working with bar engineering on the exact details of that version channel and what we expect to pass for flows. There's no stipulations through DENR on what we need to have uh, the capacity to pass for this. Um, bar engineering is working with uh, other industry experts there and to, to figure out what size of event uh, we need to pass for that. But between the draw, the lake drawdown. Uh, we'll provide some capacity for a, a storm event, but then also we would anticipate most likely a 10 to 15 year event uh, size diversion channel. Uh, but the exact details have not been determined as of now. Do we anticipate out approximately how long the project may take? Um, yeah, I can I can answer that. Yeah, we're we're expecting to get a contractor on board and. And starting shortly after the 4th of July holiday, um, that's when the parameters will start. Um, that is not dictating that the contractor must start on that day, um, but that's when the, the, the time clock starts for the contractor to be available to start doing things. Um, a lot of it will probably depend on um, if the spillway is overflowing at that time, the contractor may decide to um, delay the dewatering if there's already watering coming over the spillway they may decide to delay it but again we're leaving those parameters up to the contractor um, to determine when they actually start but we are going to have a, um, a substantial completion date of that you know spring March of 2022 timeline that substantial completion needs to be completed um, um, unless there's some kind of crazy circumstances um, that arise for that not to happen, but that's the intent for GFMP is to require that substantial completion to be done by March of 2022. I guess just to tag on that, Adam, there substantially complete, we mean a functioning spillway. There will still be button up items like uh, the the archery range, uh, cleaning up of the diversion channel, seating, erosion control, and, and items like that. But Okay. 
the lake is at a low level now. As a reference point, how much more will it need to be drawn down? Again, we are going to um, leave that on the contractor to make that decision on uh, based on their capabilities and, and, and their knowledge on how far they need to draw down. And, and they, we don't expect them to give us a, a hard solid number right away either. You know, I, I anticipate what happens is, is uh, the, uh, a drawdown will start and they'll be able to make um, decisions based on how fast things are drying out. And if they're able to um, get in there and do their work, um, they're going to be making those kind of decisions as the project goes along. And again, it's the, it's the you know, de department's intention to keep all of the folks around Mina Lake well informed those changes when they happen and um, this is a very temporary inconvenience um, in order to get the spillway this this old spillway structure replaced what incentive does a contractor have to not draw the lake down 10 feet I guess part of that is we're trying to give them that maximum limit of, of the of a 10 foot draw down there, uh, the less that they draw that lake down, the more risk that they're taking on. Um, so again, in an effort to keep this an economically feasible project there, uh, we're allowing them to draw it down that much, um, but they may not draw down to, to get out on the lake and get your siphon system uh, installed to that depth. But, from a fishery standpoint, uh, as Jason had mentioned, we don't feel that that will be a detriment to the fishery even over the winter. Um, but we want to allow them to draw that down to have as much storage capacity as possible if they so choose. Uh, in, in that event of a, of a large summer storm uh, or to handle some runoff. So you're really telling us to take our boats out right after the 4th. And then kind of in conjunction with that, if a uh, Helm Marine or whoever needs to remove my dock and lift, how much time after the fourth will they realistically have? Um, I'll, I'll take this question up. I, I, I think again, we will um, do everything that we can to give the folks the proper amount of time to be able to do those kinds of things. And once we have a contractor in place and we get a potential timeline for, for drawing the lake down, we'll be able to provide some more details that would give um, a little bit more insight on how long exactly after the 4th of July we have. But that's why we're having this meeting now is to let those folks be informed now and in order to potentially have those kinds of uh, situations already planned out. And we feel like giving you folks um, this much notice time in advance that um, those uh, potential things can be put in place now. And and again, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to uh, keep the lines of communication open and so that we can inform those uh, lake residents the best that we can um, because we don't want anybody to get caught with their pants down either. We, 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 we definitely don't want to see that and, and we want to be able to have those folks enjoy the lake for as long as they can, but also um, we would like to um, express our, our, um, um, our, our stance that, you know, we, we, we're counting on the, on the lake. On folks around the lake to you know take some personal responsibility here and and take the information that's been provided and continue to stay informed of what's going on to make the best decision for you for yourself okay We've got a couple questions about asking to put Rhett Russell's contact info up again we'll do that after all these questions are done uh, 10 foot drawdown realistic date for lake level restoration under normal runoff conditions that's so variable right now we just it's just so hard to anticipate if we continue to go into a drought and we get the normal runoff you got to fill all the all the sloughs and and small dams and stuff in the watershed as well you know it's it, it's just really hard to anticipate what that'll look like okay. uh any chance of getting COVID 19 funding for gfp um I mentioned before we we will do whatever we can to look at all avenues for funding for this project and all of the projects across the state. That's that's really what I'm, uh, my job title really is to take care of that kind of thing and always looking out for third parties um, and COVID dollars, et cetera, to end up um, trying to extend, you know, our dollars as much as we possibly can. Uh, currently there's, there's no COVID dollars uh, approved for this project, but if any would become available, we'll continue to look for those. 
What incentive will the contractor have to complete early or on time? Uh, as far as uh, on time there, uh, as with any of our products there, we'll include liquidated damage, which are typically based on the estimated uh, overall construction costs on a per calendar day basis there. Uh, so we will set that substantial completion along with the final completion date. Uh, and so anything uh, that goes past that completion date, uh, barring any additional work that may have been added, uh, which would translate to additional dollars and days, uh, those liquidated damages would be assessed if they go past that completion date. Will we be limited for those of us with sprinkler systems pumping out of the lake? That's a hard one to answer depending on how far the lake level is drawn down or where your pump system is at this point, which hopefully once we get open open water, we can get a crew out there to, uh, to do a, a lake bottom mapping and be able to produce some some images and have a contractor on board to what their anticipated drawdowns are. We will uh, provide some some uh, some maps with that anticipated water levels will look like at that time. What will water levels be once repairs are completed compared to now? Uh, as James has stated, the elevation of the spillway will be the exact same as what it currently is. So the anticipated elevations would be very similar to what they are now. As far as keeping us in tune with the project status, how will information be distributed? Um, I've been working with a couple of the Lake Association folks to uh, come up with a real good plan on getting information out. Um, what, what those folks and I have been talking about is, is uh, potentially one or a couple points of contact through the Lake Association that whenever we get updated information, um, we'll, we'll provide that information to those points of contact. And then from there, those points of contact have agreed that um, they will be the, li the liaison to the rest of the lake residents to inform them as, as changes happen. Was a coffer dam considered and what was that cost, if so? I guess I'm not sure the exact details of your uh, of the question there, but a coffer dam will likely be uh, in, uh, installed just upstream of where the current or the new spillway is going to push the water around into that uh, proposed diversion channel uh, for anything that the, the lake drawdown cannot store. So that coffer dam again would divert uh, any flows at the the drawdown can't handle and divert it around the, the construction site. What are the costs associated with not drawing the lake down? Um, you know, that's really, you know, I suppose subjective to uh, to the contractor, but um, you know, with the years of experience up here and and putting limitations on on contractors of. Um, uh, we would expect a, a substantial increase in a dewatering for that kind of thing and um, a, a much larger price um, if, if we even got contractors to bid at all, if they would you know, even be um, comfortable bidding it, bidding it based on those kind of parameters. And that's why to make this economically feasible, um, we, we are going to take the, um, the stance of allowing the contractor to uh, make those decisions. Um, in their best interest and what they feel is reasonable for them to uh, balance what it's going to cost them for dewatering and be able to still um, complete the project um, um, to substantial completion to um, to the benefit of the folks up there. So they're not not a specific dollar amount, but a significant enough cost that um, that that is an option that we haven't considered. Um, as again, we we feel like this is the best uh, the best balance of of um, you know, accommodating the folks up there and also taking into consideration the dollars. The, the, the dollar, any, any increase in dollars would end up affecting uh, other projects that go around across the state. And we have got um, you know, um, old infrastructure in all of our parks across the state and any additional dollars above and beyond what's, um, what we're kind of thinking that this project is gonna cost all affects those kinds of things. And, and that's something that's been taken into um, very much consideration when determining to, to go with this spillway design and, and construction timeline. When measuring a 10 foot drawdown, how is that measured? Where is the starting point? Um, I, I would, 
I would say this, this, the, this, the point would be at the crest elevation of uh, 14, 14, 13, 64. So um, a 10 foot drop would be at 14, 03, 64. Last July 4th, we had a big rain event and a bad storm. We will have a communication plan in place if we have to go, or will we have a communication plan in place if we have to go through something like that again while this project is underway? We all sure hope that nothing like that happens again, but again, that's why we're giving our um, contractor the um, the window to be able to um, address address that liability concern of theirs to have enough capacity, not only in the lake, but um, a large enough diversion channel to handle a large rain event. Um, I, I'm familiar with that rain event that was experienced up there last year and and, and across the state um, over the past several years, um, localized rain events like that have happened in the past. Um, we hope something like that does not happen. But again, we're really relying on our, con our contractor to take um, those kinds of things into consideration when they're, when they're doing an analysis of where they need to have the lake drawn down to have the um, proper amount of capacity and size of the diversion channel to handle that type of event in order for them to um, potentially handle some type of larger rain event and be able to get back and, and start continue working on the project as soon as possible. I, you know, I assume we'll, uh, you know, we'll keep the local emergency officials appraised of the project yes. and uh, you know, any kind of communication about any emergency events, you know, I, I assume, you know, still follow the same channels uh, through the local uh, officials. Yeah. Correct, Alan. Actually, we're working on a, a simplified emergency preparedness plan here. Uh, for any high hazard dams, we have to have an emergency action plan in place in case uh, there's potential breach of the, the dam there. Um, the DNR is requiring us to have a simplified plan in place for here for road closures uh, in case of overtopping. Uh, if the dam does look like it's going to breach, uh, closing of contacting of the railroad and the the uh, DOT downstream there. So we're uh, working on that and we look to have that approved prior to going into construction here. So that's something we have to have in place for the long run, uh, but we'll look to have that in place prior to, and then if something happens during construction, we can utilize that plan. Has anyone looked into the possible effects that would be for downstream folks with the potential of 2,000 more cubic feet per second coming out of the dam? Uh, I guess we have not specifically looked at the potential for that, but after uh, the damage in 2019, we did hire Banner on to uh, evaluate the hazard classification of the dam and if it is still at a significant uh, hazard or if it has gone up into a high hazard because of new residents downstream. Uh, with that, we hired them on to take a look at three different breach uh, scenarios there. Typically, you look at an overtopping scenario. Uh, so a very large rain event throughout the watershed uh, to where it fills that lake up and it overtops the entire embankment, in this case, Nesbitt Drive. Um, we had them look at a couple lesser events on this because we had sustained some significant damage to that spillway there. Uh, and I guess long and short of it is, is the extreme event, uh, we are still classified as a significant hazard dam. So that means there's no occupied dwellings in the inundation map or in the inundation area in case of a breach of the, the structure. So um, that is a much uh, much more extreme event. I guess I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I want to say we're in the neighborhood of 35,000 CFS as compared to what the 13,000 CFS that we'll, we will now be able to pass. Okay. Uh, and kind of in conjunction with that, what do we need to do or say or communicate to our downstream neighbors during the water drawdown? Uh, I guess in in conjunction with you know communi communicating with the lake owners there, we can uh, communicate that to uh, those downstream landowners that there will be additional flows uh, from what the normal situation would be uh, in in late summer there. I guess with that. Um, this is not a high hazard dam, so we do not have a list of all those uh, landowners that are potentially affected. I guess we would uh, maybe ask for assistance on how to get that information out to our down, the downstream landowners. Uh, very good point, because we've uh, all been talking about our upstream landowners and how it would affect them. So um, 
maybe if we can make them aware of the how we're uh, disseminating the information to the upstream landowners there, they can be privy to that information also. A couple of good jobs in there. Thank you very much. Will the diversion channel be lined in some way, or is it just going to be a ditch? Uh, again, we're working on the details of that with bar engineering. Uh, at the end of the day, it will be an earthen channel. Uh, and I guess to, to touch on some of the uh, I was going to chime in earlier there about uh, the potential of not drawing the lake down there. I guess with it being an earthen channel there, there is the potential for head cutting and erosion when this uh, does function, uh, So, which could lead to a potential breach of the entire structure uh, and then damage to the downstream railroad and highway bridges there. So part of that drawing the lake down is to mitigate some of the risk and liability of a complete breach of our, our dam uh, and or damage to the, the existing work site or downstream infrastructure. So that is, that's something that's hard to put a number on uh, as far as, you know, if we're considering dollars versus, you know, do we bypass all of the flows around to keep the lake full? Um, but again, it's, it's to reduce that risk and liability of washing out our work site and the potential entire dam and downstream uh, infrastructure being the, the highway bridge and the train bridge. So, okay. Got the information up there. We had caught up on questions, but it looks like got a couple more. Let's see. Could we arrange a time with Mr. Russell could come up to the lake to meet with a variety of landowners who want to do shoreline work so they could work through the details face to face? As long as you don't call me Mr. Russell at the meeting, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a yes from Rhett. Um, yeah. And will you allow us to save your PowerPoint presentation to share with others? Yes, the, the, the intention is to put the PowerPoint presentation along with a uh, list of uh, Q&A questions that were provided by Mr. Kessler and have those uploaded to the state website. And I will share that information with um, uh, you, Julie, and, um, and George Kessler and allow you guys to be able to disseminate that um, information to the rest of the folks that were not, um, in attendance tonight and those that were not able to attend. Okay, that's, that's it for... Exterior questions? Okay, uh, I, I want to thank everyone very much for all of those questions. Um, again, the whole goal here was to be very transparent from the Game Fish and Park standpoint. Um, and um, um, I would like to again thank everyone for their participation. And um, you know, I, I really want to reiterate the point that this is really a, a small inconvenience, short-term temporary um, inconvenience for those lake owners um, in order to get this spillway um, reconstructed. You know, we're dealing with a lot of old infrastructure spillways across the state, and um, the state will not be able to replace them all at one time. And this one is a, a high enough hazard, and um, with the damage that's been caused before, it was recommended uh, recommended by our consultant engineer that this structure should be replaced as soon as possible. And so, um, you know, delaying this project for any type of reason or, or trying to do other things that you know, end up driving the cost or all things that could end up you know, moving toward this thing being delayed or, or, or take multiple seasons. And we really feel like we've put together a plan in place that, um, that uh, basically balances uh, the use to you know, try to shorten that window up um, so that uh, the, affected, the affected use season for you folks is, is uh, as short as possible. And again, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll pray for Mother Nature to uh, fill that structure back up. And so that, again, it will be a relatively temporary inconvenience and at the end, um, we're going to have a really nice structure there that um, you folks won't have to worry about the temporary repairs failing anytime soon with the new structure. And so, again, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, this will be posted up on the Game Fish and Park website. I encourage you to share with your neighbors that weren't in attendance tonight. Um, and that contact information will also be up on GFMP's website. Um, my information there, you can call me uh, directly if you'd like to have any uh, questions answered or uh, Rhett Russell regarding some of the um, fish and aquatic and shoreline uh, work type things. 
Um, those are the, the two people to um, uh, to be in tune with. And then, um, you know, as as the construction starts and we get going here, we'll, we'll continue to do our best to keep everyone informed. And that's when we'll probably ask to bring in some of our other local staff per people around that area. Uh, Robert Teachout is our district manager out of the out of that area for the campground. Um, he will be involved um, very heavily with the day-to-day -day operations in that area, determining, um, you know, working with those folks that have questions, and we, we plan to keep him very informed on what's going on so that uh, he's kind of our, our, our boots-on-the-ground person that can, that can handle that kind of thing. And he'll also be responsible for putting on must-reads in our camping reservation system, so um, folks that are anticipating coming up there and using the recreation area, they will have a must-read before they uh, make the reservation that will um, let them know what's going on at the time that um, they're looking at making a reservation because we don't want to get into the business of uh, folks um, anticipating that they can bring their their uh, boats up there and use them when you know the uh, boat ramp is closed due to the um, the drawdown etc and we plan on facilitating that uh, that information as as good as we possibly can through gf and p um if there if there aren't any last minute questions here um, again thank you everybody for your time and uh, we look forward to working with everyone in the future here to get this project complete thank you okay thank you, thank you everyone thank you yeah.